Tonight I want to begin very quickly with the list of test questions for the past few months of study that we've done in ITP. I want to go over them quickly enough to perhaps record them on the tape for those that aren't here and for future generations if we're around that long. And so let me do that. ITP test, number one. What were the four major distinguishing characteristics of the religious system known as Judaism? Number two, explain the practice called Corban. And where is that found in the New Testament? Number three, briefly outline and chronicle the history and fate of the second temple. So what this third question will give you the opportunity to do is to give some of the dates, some of the historical dates for the fate of the second temple. You could even go to some New Testament passages which will provide dates in number figures as well. Number four, according to the Talmud, what was lacking in the second temple? Number five, what are the two Greek words in the New Testament for temple? And what's the difference between the two? Number six, discuss the geography of the Temple Mount. Discuss the geography of the Temple Mount. You might could supply some information as far as elevation above sea level, uh, distinguishing characteristics of maybe some of the valleys. If you can remember the names of the different valleys and where they were around the Temple Mount, the size of the Temple Mount, uh, the area in which it was increased. And part of number six as well, discuss the geography of the Temple Mount and the relation of Matthew 4 and verse 5 to it. Number seven, why was the Temple Mount so large? Number eight, diagram from memory in as much detail as possible the buildings and layout of the temple precincts. You need a whole piece of paper for that with a diagram. In as much detail as you can remember, gates and colonnades and courts and walls and the divisions within the temple precincts. Number nine, select seven details from your diagram, in number eight, and discuss what you know about them many different details we gave you. We're leaving it up to you to pick seven of the details. For instance, Solomon's Stables, so-called. For instance, Robinson's Arch, as well as some of the better known. Those may not be that well known or remembered by you. There are some that are much better known than that. But some of the details, seven of them from number eight, and discuss what you know about them. Number 10. What made the Herodian temple such an important contributing economic factor within the city of Jerusalem? And number 11, what might a Passover pilgrim have to consider in his annual trip to Jerusalem? Okay, on the bottom of page five, we're gonna to come to a new heading tonight. I have it placed under the general discussion of the temple. It doesn't really relate to the temple, but it is a building, and that is the Jewish synagogue. The Jewish synagogue. So that's why we have it here. We've got under the temple these four points, the Babylonian captivity, the post-exilic times. We spent a whole lot of time on number three, Herod's temple and will be for a, a few weeks, a month at least, I would say, on number four, the synagogue. Its history, purpose, officials, order of service, and the Christian importance of the early New Testament synagogues. And then we'll go on to, on the last page, page six, something else entirely. So that's where we're going to be for the next five or six weeks on the Jewish synagogue. Tonight, I'd like to begin by discussing its origin and the New Testament Greek term. 
at the important council of Jerusalem, the Apostle James made this very remarkable statement. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. The problem, the background to Acts 15, concern Gentile converts in foreign lands. So the reference is not to anything going on in Israel or in Palestine, but to the Jewish diaspora world at large. Now we have already used this passage, Acts 15:21 once in ITP during the last year, and that was when we discussed the diaspora. James makes a very remarkable claim that Moses, since old times, has in every city, in every city, he doesn't mean Palestine, he means outside of Palestine, them that preach him. And we were able to justify that claim from our study of the diaspora that the diaspora was in fact worldwide, at least in the Mediterranean Roman Empire and world, and that in fact there were Jewish people everywhere in every city. Now we're going to use it again because of its conclusion being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Well, the New Testament itself justifies the conclusion of this statement by locating synagogues in the following places by name. In Galilee there was a synagogue at Nazareth. There was a synagogue, that's Luke 4, there was a synagogue at Capernaum, Mark 1. There is a synagogue at Jerusalem, Acts 6. One at Damascus, Acts 9. One at Salamis of Cyprus and Pisidian Antioch in Acts, four, in Acts 13, one in Iconium in Acts 14, Thessalonica, Berea and Athens in Acts 17, Corinth in Acts 18, Ephesus in Acts 19. Now, I only gave you a couple of Palestinian cities, Nazareth, Capernaum, and Jerusalem. The rest of those are outside the, bi the bounds of Israel or Palestine. They're out in the diaspora world. These are the ones that are given by name. I'll go over them again. Damascus, skipping the ones in Palestine. Salamis, S-A-L-A-M-I-S, of the island of Cyprus. This is in Acts 13. The city in Antioch. There's the Syrian Antioch. That's also in Acts 13. There was a Jewish synagogue at Iconium, at Thessalonica, at Berea, at Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus. And those are only the ones that are mentioned by name in the New Testament. There are many others mentioned by name outside of the New Testament, and actually, there are many more in the New Testament that are alluded to, but that aren't referred to by name. I think James' statement is justified, being read in the synagogues, synagogues, S-Y-N-A-G-O-G-U-E-S, the synagogues. Well, we've already mentioned the tremendous role the diaspora played in uh, providentially paving the way for the spread of early Christianity, and as we'll see in this study, the synagogue was the focal point of it all. So we need to say certain things about the synagogue. First of all, concerning its origin then tonight, the origin of the synagogue. We don't have any certain documented information that's reliable. We have a lot of information about the origin of the synagogue, but I'm afraid it's not that reliable. For instance, both Philo and Josephus tell us that the synagogue was first formed and organized back in the 15th century B.C. under the first ruler of the synagogue, Moses. Well, I think that's just an attempt to give it a claim of antiquity. And if you've got a claim of antiquity, you have a claim for its authority as well. 
Well, there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for that anywhere in the Bible, that Moses was the organizer of the first synagogue in the wilderness. Now, if you want to kind of use the term loosely or something and say, well, they synagogued in the wilderness, I guess that'd be okay. But Philo and Josephus are trying to make a claim for antiquity for the synagogue, thus claiming authority for it as well. But the truth, rather, seems to lie in a combination of things springing out of the Babylonian captivity. In other words, I don't think we see synagogues in the world until after the Babylonian captivity and exile. There are no references to synagogues in existence in the Old Testament period. There are no references to synagogues in existence in the Old Testament period. And yet, you know, whenever we open the pages of the New Testament, they are flourishing all over the world. We've got James' statement in Acts 15, 21, that Moses of old time hath in every city those that read him in the synagogues every Sabbath day. But beyond that, we just have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the book of Acts before chapter 15 and afterwards that talk about synagogues, synagogues, synagogues. Well, where did these things come from? What's the origin of them? Contra Philo and Josephus, Moses didn't originate them. They had to have a start somewhere. Well, our point of interesting conclusion here is that if there is no reference to their existence in the Old Testament period, and they are flourishing literally in the world in the New Testament period, I think that tends to focus our eyes again on the importance of the intertestamental period. Something is happening in ITP to give us something when we open the New Testament that we don't find whenever we turn to the Old. So I would list two contributing factors. All of this concerns Babylonian captivity. It's a combination of things that spring from that. But two contributing factors I would list in what I understand about the origin of the synagogues. And let it be known that we don't have a reference to any precise date or a definite figure, a definite occasion in a specific place where the first synagogue originated. It's just that it appears as though we've got certain factors after the Babylonian captivity that combine to contribute to bring forth this, this need that hasn't existed prior to Babylonian captivity for the synagogue, and then the synagogue itself is supplied to fulfill that need. So in the first place, I would say that one contributing factor was the exile itself and the loss of the Jewish temple. Really, I'm combining two things to begin with. The exile itself and the loss of the Jewish temple. Now, we're well aware of the fact that in the 15th century B.C., God did lead his people with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm out of a land of bondage in Egypt, and he led them into the promised land, and he gave them Moses, and he gave them deliverers we call judges, and he gave them prophets, and finally he gave them kings, and one generation after another chose to rebel against the sovereign rule of the Almighty God and do whatever they desired to do. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 2 and verse 32, or he asks rhetorically concerning Israel's sin, this question, Jeremiah 2:32, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people hath forgotten me days without number. That's what Jeremiah the prophet said to Israel right on the eve of Babylonian captivity and exile. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. I mean, God has lost counting the generations, the years, the days, the centuries that his people has forgotten him. And so as a result, we have this great catastrophe that Jeremiah laments so heavily about in five chapters in that book called Lamentations, the Babylonian captivity and exile. And through it all, they lose their temple. So here's the point of this, that once they're in a foreign land, and that's exactly where they are and what's going on, they're stationed in a foreign land, then the people probably had to find some way to stay together and to keep the faith. Now, a lot of this is historical reconstruction, but it makes a lot of sense, though. Once you have been uprooted 
from your native land with all of the familiarities of Palestine in the Jewish liturgy at the Jewish temple, and you have been planted in a foreign land, then people have to find some way to stay together and keep the faith. Otherwise, the conclusion would be they would simply be assimilated into the Babylonian culture. And we would no longer have, down to this day, a distinct race of people known as the Jews. The Jews would have just been assimilated into some other Near Eastern people. They had to find a way to keep the faith and stay together. Uh, for instance, if you turn over to Psalm 137, we do see a few references of the people somewhere, somehow in Babylon, being or staying together. Psalm 137, the whole psalm, verses 1 through 9, Psalm 137. Uh, this is a post-exilic psalm in that it does look back into maybe the not that distant past on Israel's history in exile. Now remember what Jeremiah said, yet my people have forgotten me days, days, days without number. Well, they learned quite a lesson. It's just too bad they had to learn it with the severity that they did according to the book of Lamentations, that to forsake God is to incur the justice and the wrath of the Almighty God. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, spoke some Jewish people. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, but at least they're together. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us myrrh, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Well, in other words, probably with a taunt included here, with sarcasm. Sing us one of your lovely Jewish tap dance songs. But the author responds, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. Remember, the Edomites were of long time antagonists of the Jews. And when they saw the Babylonians come in, they just jumped in with glee and raise it, raise it to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. Now, I know it doesn't read exactly like the Sermon on the Mount, but it's not supposed to. This is good Old Testament theocratic justice being expressed here. Same as what David uh, has to pray a couple of Psalms later, that I hate thine enemies, thine enemies. He doesn't have any as himself, but I hate thine enemies with a perfect hatred. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Well, our purpose in turning it would be the first two verses here, that they are meeting together by the waters, the rivers of Babylon, sitting down and weeping. They may have chosen to meet in groups, if possible, on Sabbath days. The Sabbath law in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 was well grounded in Israel's theology and history was very important for them, regardless of the cultural, historical situation or context, to regard the Sabbath day and to keep it holy unto the Lord God. They may have chosen, in other words, then to meet in groups if possible on Sabbath days. And so what I'm saying is that this then could have been the precursor to the official synagogue. We don't have the name synagogue. We don't see official meetings. But I'm saying this historical situation of a people cast out of their land, uh, of a people at least temporarily forsaken by God. Now, God came down with great authority and um, a punishment through the prophets in saying what he was going to do to his people. But he also had some happy things to say to the prophets as well. Only for a remnant, not for them all. Hosea said in Hosea 14.4, God speaking through the prophet Hosea 14.4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For mine anger has turned away from him. So God sees a remnant in the future to whom he will be gracious and to whom his pardon will be granted. 
And for those few in Babylon who chose to stay together and keep the faith, they may actually have formed the precursor, the very beginnings, to the official synagogues that were to arise. Another, for instance, would be over in the book of Ezekiel. Now, you see, you have to kind of know some of those kind of obscure passages in Scripture where, you know, you don't turn to them every day for comfort or for doctrine or theology, but they help us reconstruct, at least in a hypothetical way, what probably was taking place in Babylon among the exiles. Now, we know we have some people who are still back in Israel, but the chief men, the best men, the princes, the leaders, many of them were taken away in the first couple of captivities in uh, the 600s and late 500s B.C. In Ezekiel 14 and verse 1, we have this reference by Ezekiel, a prophet who's in captivity in Babylon. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. Ezekiel 14, 1. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot to you, but that's probably a hint of the fact that we've got people together, Jews in Babylonian exile and captivity, who are meeting together. Now, maybe they're not always meeting for the purest of motives. We find that some of these who are coming and sitting before Ezekiel don't want to hear the word of the Lord by the mouth of his prophet Ezekiel. And God has a thing or two to say to them. But surely there must be people together. I mean, to get it out of just the purely technical or historical, think of yourself. What if you were scattered in some far place or you were taken away from this church or something? Are you just going to say, well, that's too bad. I guess I had my opportunity. Or would you try to sanctify some day or, or some type of occasion or something if you and some others were scattered to, to remember the Lord? I mean, you're not remembering this church like you had to, for the Jews, remember the temple or something, but to keep yourself distinct and keep yourself from being assimilated into a pagan environment. You're going to have to find something to do. When, for instance, whenever I went to college, you know, I wasn't uh, the type that went home. I didn't have any way to get home, and home was too far away to go anyway every weekend. Well, I wasn't going to attend some dead Presbyterian or even AG church around there on campus, and we had our choice of those. I mean, student ministry just coming out of the woodwork. I wasn't going to attend any of those abominations of desolations. And so you know what I did? I had church at home, or in the dorm room to be more precise. I had church by myself. With my Bible, with my tape player, that was my church service right there. I couldn't just get up Sunday and say, well, you know, I, I won't be at church for probably six months and I'm at school and because you'll just be assimilated in that environment. So you separate that time Sunday morning to listen to tapes. Not that I wasn't doing it the rest of the week, but that was a special time to have worship services alone. So I guess I was like a little Jewish exile then a little Christian exile, exile from my home church down into a foreign Babylonian intellectual environment at a university. And so I didn't have an Ezekiel to go sit before. If I had one, I would have gone. So I just sat before my tape player in my Bible. Then in chapter 20 and verse 1, we've got a, a similar reference. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 1. I mean, that's what I would like to think I would do if I were ever separated from the church. I'd want to somehow stay in contact with the Spirit anyway. And it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Now here's where he said, well, I won't be inquired of you, end of verse 3, because they came with the wrong attitude. But if you combine Psalm 137, a couple of passages here in Ezekiel, and just some common sense, what are the Jews going to be doing on a Sabbath day when God said, keep that day holy? He didn't say keep it holy as long as you're in Palestine. That was a creation decree for them that had been incorporated into the Mosaic law. Keep that day holy and sanctify it unto the Lord. And they were going to do that wherever they were. So you're in a foreign land. You don't have your temple to depend on then you begin to congregate together and do something else. All right, that brings me to a second contributing factor, I would say, to the origin of the Jewish synagogue. And that concerns the post-exilic emphasis upon the Torah. Or to say it another way, according to Scripture, Ezra's emphasis upon the law. The 
post-exilic emphasis on the Torah under the ministry of the priest and prophet and scribe Ezra. We do know that the law, the Torah, the five books of Moses, becomes increasingly important with the loss of the temple. You say, well, it's restored. Yes, it's restored on a much smaller scale. They don't have the finances to do anything better or bigger. And so you're going to have to shift your religious emphasis from that point on. Earlier, it had been, according to Jeremiah, a superstitious attachment to the temple in that they would cry whenever the prophets came and said, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to judge you and send you away into captivity. Oh, they would say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now, what does that signify? Well, they would point to the temple and say, prophet Jeremiah, prophet whomever, the temple is still there. God's presence is still there. What mean you by this prophecy of judgment to come and of exile for us? God's temple is still there, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Well, of course, that temple was only going to stand a few more years. They didn't realize that. They didn't realize that God was giving them a last minute, a last generation, a last era warning to them. And that is repent or perish. But with their superstitious attachment to the temple, they kept saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Well, once that's destroyed, it's going to shift then the focus of your religious inquiry. No longer can it be on the temple. You're going to have to gear your energy in some other direction. And so we see from Scripture, from the record of Scripture itself, that after the exile, the law becomes increasingly important. That's one of the interesting factors in Judaism, that by the time of the New Testament, the study of the law has become so important that it has degenerated into letterism and legalism. That's the whole business with the Pharisees. I mean, you don't see the Pharisees worshiping the temple. You see them worshiping the law, the law, the law, the tradition of the elders. The study of the law has become so important by New Testament times that it has degenerated into letterism or legalism. Now, Ezra is the one who paves the way for that. Now, let me make sure I don't include him in the guilt. I mean, it's right what Ezra does, but Ezra, in insisting on the importance of the law, rightfully so, simply supplies the first step for later generations then to look back and say, well, look, Ezra insisted on this, and Moses insisted on it, and Joshua insisted on it. And so study, study, study the law. They studied the law, but they divorced themselves from obedience to that law. As long as they could study and remember it and devise all these neat uh, legalistic type schemes, they thought they were pleasing to God. But they had divorced the content of the law from the law or to say it another way, the spirit of it from the letter, their observance of the law from their study of it. For instance, if you turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8, we're saying that the loss of the temple and then later its restoration on a much smaller scale tends to push the study of the law to the height of Jewish religious concerns. In the post-exilic period, the Bible makes very clear that groups came together, this happens to be in Israel, but that groups came together for the reading of the law. Nehemiah chapter 8. You have to be able to put these facts together in this order to work your way back to a, a supposed origin for the Jewish synagogue. Nehemiah chapter 8, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Now, why didn't they do that to Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah came bringing the law of Moses, the word of the Lord to them. They rejected him. Why didn't they do that to one of the earlier prophets? Well, they've been chastised. They've learned the hard way that it pays to serve God. It doesn't pay to be disobedient to him. Now they're wanting the law, the law, the law. Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding and upon the first, upon the first day of the seventh month. And so we go through a reading of it and evidently a paraphrase of it. Verse 8, 
into Aramaic since they ceased to really comprehend Hebrew. You have your ancient Aramaic Targumim, or they're sometimes just called by the English pluralized form, the Targums. And you just see them obeying all types of things. They see, for instance, in verses 13 through 15, the um, Feast of Tabernacles. So look at verse 16. They went and made themselves booths. They obey in a hurry now. Everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts. You can pass Jewish houses even here in America and see a little scarecrow up on top of their house around certain times of the year. And in their courts, of the, in the courts of the house of God, in the street by the water gate, in the street by the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat into the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so? What did Jeremiah say? For my people hath forgotten me days without number, from Joshua's time to Jeremiah's time, a half a millennium. For the continuation of this message, what did Jeremiah say? For my people hath forgotten me days without number, from Joshua's time to Jeremiah's time, a half a millennium. And we can see why the end of verse 17 would be true, and there was very great gladness well if this is taking place among the exiles who are at this time returned to Jerusalem and Israel it only stands to reason that they probably gathered for the law back in Babylon they had their priests Ezra being one of them they had leaders Nehemiah was another one back in Babylon they could easily have gathered together back in Babylon for again this precursor to the official synagogue in later Jewish history to study the law and my claim to you tonight is that's exactly what did take place in Babylon there was a gathering together of the people due to the loss of the temple which then heightened their awareness of the need for the Mosaic law they sat under their leaders and prophets and priests Levites and teachers and had the word of God presented to them through the five books of Moses. And as we're going to see, you say, what does that have to do with the origin of the synagogue? As we're going to see, this is the very origin of the synagogue. And then I might add that both Jewish and Christian tradition recognize Ezra as in some way the founder of the synagogue or at least what led to it. Ezra is often called in Jewish writings the founder of the great synagogue the founder of the great synagogue and Christian tradition supports that that in some way Ezra is either the founder of the synagogue or if we really want to be safe historically since we don't really have a proof of that a founder of at least what led to the later official Jewish synagogue now do you understand those two contributing factors then Okay, in any event, synagogues are flourishing throughout the world by the first few centuries before Christ. We know they are in the New Testament. But by the first few centuries B.C., before Christ, they are flourishing throughout the world. They are first found only in the diaspora. Then later they gradually find their way into Israel. Now, no, that's not a strange order. Their reluctance in Israel was due to the fact that at least Jerusalem already had the great temple of Zerubbabel and later of Herod. In Israel, you have less need of a synagogue than somewhere else in the Roman world. So they were first found in the diaspora world. Then gradually, they actually made their way into Israel and into the capital city of Jerusalem. Now, there is one Old Testament reference, if you turn to Psalm 74, 8. There's one time in the King James Old Testament where the word synagogue appears in the Old Testament, Psalm 74, 8. 
They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. That's the only reference in the Old Testament, the KJV, to synagogue. It's Psalm 74, 8. Now, some people have claimed that this is a late psalm of the Persian era. And therefore, synagogues could well be in existence at that time. But the true Hebrew word that officially corresponds to the Greek synagogue is not here or anywhere found in the Old Testament. So I'd be a little hesitant saying that this is a Persian period psalm and an actual official synagogue as we know such to be later in history is under consideration in Psalm 74 and verse 8. It's unclear all this verse is saying historically, but that some type of meeting places of the Jews have been destroyed is true. In other words, these need not be synagogues as we're going to go on to discuss them over the next few weeks. Some type of meeting place. If it is the late Psalm it, and it does refer to something earlier, and they did use the synagogue term, it may have been used in place of just an informal type meeting and meeting place that appeared in Jewish history somewhat earlier. So in other words, all I'm saying, if you didn't get all that, is Psalm 74, 8, and it's apparent, the appearance of the term synagogues here doesn't prove anything. They are not in existence in Old Testament times. The only way you can make this anything is say it's a late psalm. Put it in the Persian period. Well, remember, Persian period is post-exilic. That's not what we call Old Testament period or time. That's what we call ITP, the period between the Testaments. It's not really clear what this verse is saying historically. I would just say that some type of meeting places of the Jews have been destroyed. Okay, there's something concerning the origin. I want to come next of all to the term to the Greek term for synagogue. Now, the word is familiar to you, but when you look at a moment, you see that it's a little unusual. I mean, if you spell it on your page, it's not like any other term you're running into all the time. It's a rather unusual word. The famous linguistic dictionary known as Kittle has over 50 packed pages just on this term synagogue or synagogue. I'm only going to give you some of the highlights and what's important. If you want to know everything, read Kittle. <laughs> You've got 50 packed pages on the term, but I don't think that that type of discussion is really necessary in this class. So here's the word in Greek. S-U-N-A-G-O-G-E. S-U-N-A-G-O-G-E, synagogue. Synagogue is the Greek term from which we get synagogue. Synagogue appears 56 times in the Greek New Testament. 56 times synagogue in the Greek New Testament. Luke's writings dominate. with 15 occurrences in his gospel and 19 in his acts. That's well over half the New Testament times are just in Luke and writings. 15 in Luke's gospel and 19 in Luke's acts. Matthew then uses the term nine times. I mean, it, Luke just dominates the scene. We're talking about occurrences of synagogue in the New Testament. Matthew, with his long gospel, 28 chapters, only nine times. Mark 8, John uses synagogue four times, two in his gospel and two in Revelation. And probably the most interesting appearance of it anywhere in the New Testament is the one lone occasion where it pops up in James. That should total up to 56. 
Now, our English word is obviously a transliteration. Synagogue, look up here, synagogue is obviously a transliteration. And that doesn't really help you much. Well, what is a synagogue? What does that Greek word synagogue mean? Just a transliteration of it doesn't help you with the meaning. Okay, in Greek, a brief definition of synagogue, or just what the word means, is a place of assembly. Or you could just say a meeting place. That's what the word synagogue means, a meeting place. A meeting place, a place of assembly. In Greek, it can also mean the meeting itself. And rarely it can mean the people, the congregation at the meeting or in the meeting place. Acts 13, 42 to 43. But generally, the vast majority of the times in the New Testament, synagogue is used for the building itself, the actual building that is used for the assembling of the people. I would say that the word synagogue, the way it's used in Greek, is very, is very similar to the word church in English. Church in English can mean the building. It can mean the meeting. Well, let's go to church, not really meaning the building, but let's go to, to church, you know, the meeting itself, or you being the church. Well, we are the church. Church can be used, that English word, in many different ways. I think that synagogue is similar. Now, that number 56 does not include the times it occurs with a prepositional prefix, as in the case of being cast out of the synagogue in John 16, or in references to the ruler of the synagogue, such as Jairus in Mark 5. In other words, you've got synagogue attached to a prepositional prefix. The KJV is fairly accurate and consistent in its translation of this term. But let me just note three peculiarities. The KJV is fairly consistent and accurate in rendering synagogue as synagogue, meaning the building itself. But there are a few peculiarities I would just note in the KJV. One of those is Acts 6-9, which is a troublesome verse in itself. Acts 6-9. If you count by an English concordance like Strong's, how many times synagogue appears, you'll get more than 56. And that's because English concordances count italicized occurrences, which uh, mean that the Greek isn't behind it if it's italicized. And so a Greek count wouldn't include that. One of these would be Acts 6 Six, nine. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, now that's in the Greek, which is called the synagogue, notice that's italicized, of, and it lists these various groups disputing with this man Stephen. So if you're counting by an English concordance, you end up with more than 56 because an English concordance will count the italicized occurrences. A second peculiarity in the KJV is Acts 13. 42 and 43. Acts 13, 42 and 43. We've got two peculiarities here. One in verse 42, they follow a variant that's not reliable, but that doesn't really matter because the synagogue is implied. We've dealt with this verse and corrected it when we studied the diaspora. And when the apostles were gone out, the Jews besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath, is how the verse should read. Well, gone out of what? Well, the synagogue is implied here. There was a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, which is where they are. But that's following an inferior variant or reading to actually have synagogue in the text. But then look in verse 43. Synagogue in the Greek, synagogue is there. But look how it's translated. Now when the, what? Synagogue, the congregation, there's a rare occurrence. 
where synagogue means the people itself and not the building. It means the people of the congregation. Acts 13, 43. Now when the congregation, when the synagogue, the synagogue was broken up, and so forth. And then finally, in James 2, 2. If you know anything about James, you know James 2, 2 and the problems that it presents. This is the most unique occurrence of synagogue in the New Testament. Your margin informs you of the Greek. You don't have it in the text. You would almost take from the text that the other Greek term, ekklesia, was the term here, but it's not. James 2, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For if there come unto your assembly, well, you know that's the best English translation for ecclesia, not church, but my assembly. The assembly of God is the ecclesia of God. Well, ecclesia is not the term behind assembly in the Greek. The term behind it is synagogue. If there come unto your synagogue is literally what you should have. You have to mark out assembly and get synagogue from the margin. If there come unto your synagogue a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel and there come a man dressed differently and so forth. Now there are a variety of views as to why James chose this word. Much of your understanding, let me just say this, that much of your understanding of the appearance of synagogue in James 2.2 connects with your understanding of James 1.1. Very easy to remember. As I say, if you know anything about James, and if you don't, you'll learn about it in the NT intro when this, this passage and the appearance of synagogue is one of the crucial things in the whole little epistle of James from a New Testament intro standpoint is the one appearance of synagogue in James. That's what has always made it stand out in my memory. That there, your interpretation of 2-2 two, two will connect with 1-1 one, one and vice versa. Your understanding of 1-1, one, one, James 1-1, one, one, will connect with your understanding of James 2-2. Two, two. In other words, in what sense are we to understand the 12 tribes of the diaspora? James 1.1, 1, 1, we just mentioned this briefly when we discussed the diaspora in ITP. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is by the apostle James, half-brother of the Lord, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Well, what is his reference? What does he mean in referring to the recipients as the 12 tribes scattered abroad? That's the term diaspora, the understanding of the term diaspora, the 12 tribes of the diaspora. To whom is he really writing here? You see, if you're just thinking, well, obviously, if he called them the 12 tribes, I would think of Gad and Reuben and Judah and Benjamin and all those folk. And since those are Jews, obviously those Jews should be meeting in synagogues. Well, then why is he teaching them all about Christian doctrine here? Why does he end up by saying, now, if you've got any sick, then call the elders of the church? He's writing, to, it sounds like, to Christian people here. There are various views on the origin and purpose and recipients of James. Is he writing to a purely Jewish constituency, to a Jewish Christian group? Or is this a figurative reference in James 1.1. 1, 1. The twelve tribes scattered abroad, therefore meaning the church, with no thought of an ethnic Jew or an ethnic Gentile background. Is it purely Jewish? Is it Jewish Christian, writing to Jews who have converted to Christ and who therefore are perhaps still meeting or have an occasion to meet in a synagogue? Or is the reference in James 1.1 1, 1 purely figurative to the 12 tribes scattered abroad? He just means as the Jews have been scattered out into the world, so have God's people, the church. Not thinking of Jew or Gentile church or Jew and Gentile church, just the church. So are they also pilgrims in this world, not in their natural home, but scattered out into the world. There's a purely figurative or symbolic reference there. Therefore, 
we would take verse 2 of chapter 2 similarly. If they're coming to your synagogue, well, he doesn't mean to imply that the church is meeting in a Jewish synagogue, but synagogue simply means assembly. And he's just using a Jewish term that would refer to the same thing that ecclesia would in the Greek, both meaning assembly. Well, let me give you several points about James 2, 2. I'm sure I'll have a little more to say in New Testament introduction, but even there, we can only go so far. In the first place, the early date and the strong Jewish flavor, Now I realize, although it gets over your head right now, that by me starting off by saying the early date is really reasoning in a circle, but we'll get to that some other time. But I realize that. I'll just let you know I realize that. The early date and strong Jewish flavor of the epistle could perhaps have us at a period of transition so that Jewish Christians have not fully made a break with Judaism. Now, there are some strong arguments in favor of this approach to James 2, 2. At the early date, we're fairly certain on that, and the strong Jewish flavor, and there's no question about that. All you have to do is read James, and you know this is a Jewish epistle the strong Jewish flavor of the epistle, perhaps have us at a period of transition so that Jewish Christians have not fully made a break with Judaism. They, therefore, continue to meet in Jewish synagogues like the early church continued to meet in the temple according to Acts 2 and Acts 3 in the first few years of the early church's existence. Remember, the early church met in the temple, or the temple precincts at least, and nothing wrong with that. So why would there be anything wrong with early Jewish Christians continuing to meet in Jewish synagogues, using that building as their building of meeting? Whether they were holding a completely Christian service here or just meeting with some unsaved Jews to hear the law read is another matter. It would seem a little unlikely that the local Jewish authorities in whatever city these 12 tribes are scattered abroad in would make their official building, the synagogue, available to these apostate Jews called Jewish Christians. So maybe the Jews were, the, the saved Christian Jews were just there with, other Jews who were unsaved so they could fellowship with one another, that is, Christian Jews with Christian Jews, and hear the law of Moses being read. An analogy might be a charismatic today in the first few months of his experience who sees nothing wrong with going back to his denominational church, like I did, going back with, with no thought of leaving, going back with, with a new hunger, the first time you've ever had it, to really hear a sermon preach. I remember once I got the baptism, I never thought of leaving church. And I never thought of criticizing my minister. I never thought of trying to get him filled with the Spirit. I went back thinking, I didn't know there was any other church besides this. I, didn't, I never heard of independent Pentecostal charismatic churches. This was the Church of the Lord, Presbyterians, founded way back by John Knox. So it has at least that many centuries behind it. And I went back hungry to hear what my Presbyterian pastor had to preach every Sunday. And I got something out of it. I mean, I really did. Whether he knew it or not, it could have been old, dead, dry denominationalism to him. But I went with receptive ears. So you could have something like that taking place here, according to one argument. Or another view, secondly, under James 2, 2, another view is that the word is simply being used to speak of the meeting of the people. And the word can mean that, and not the meeting itself. If there come unto your assembly, or your assembling, we would say, since it would be the meeting of the people, there come to your assembling. Not if there come to your building, such and such building, we can describe it architecturally by these dimensions and geographically at this location and so forth. No, not that, just your assembling. These people dressed in different ways. They're still Jewish using Jewish terms, rather, because that's their background. There are several instances in the second century A.D. 
of Christian meetings being designated with this term. That's what lends some credibility to this view. There are several instances in the second century A.D. Second century A.D. That's a long time after the early break with Judaism that the Christian, Jewish Christians made, long after the destruction of the temple, where Christian meetings are being designated by this term, synagogue. Just because that was a Jewish background, and after all, the term can mean that. Generally, it means the building, but on occasions it can mean the meeting itself or the people themselves. But in conclusion, and this is all I'm going to say tonight concerning James 2.2, because it involves a whole lot of different issues in one's interpretation, James 1.1 1, 1, and James 2.2 2, and the flavor of the epistle and just a lot of other things. I think it's important to remember that the church term, ecclesia, is used in this book. Sometimes so much is said and argued about in James 2 over this term, synagogue as though these are Jews or Jewish Christians and they don't know anything about the church, they're just meeting with other Jews in some synagogal setting, that people fail to remember that the church term that the Lord Jesus used when founding the church, ecclesia, is used over in chapter 5 and verse 14. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the synagogue. Well, there were elders of the synagogue, to be sure. Let him call for the elders of the ecclesia, not synagogue. Let him call for the elders of the church. So perhaps they were meeting in synagogues, but the people meeting there were the church. We'll save further discussion of that for later. So tonight, the origin of the synagogue, the term synagogue.